Chapter 6 Go Bags If you've encountered preppers anywhere, then you've probably heard of a go bag. Put simply, this is the bag you grab when you need to GTFO with zero notice. I don't have a go bag in the traditional sense, but as they are such an iconic part of the prepper community, they bear some explanation. The concept of a go bag is simple. When the shit hits the fan and you need to flee, this is the bag already waiting. You stock it with everything you think you might need in an emergency, and many people keep theirs in their car. While mine may not fit in a single bag, my truck contains all the following right now as we speak. One flat of 20 1.5 liter water bottles, a big blanket and two sleeping bags, an air compressor that will run from the car, a toolbox with duplicates of important tools I think I could need, two camp chairs, a big bag of trail mix, assorted snacks, two flashlights, two changes of clothes, two weeks of contacts, basic toiletries, all stored in my camping backpack, designed to hold 50 pounds of gear in the backcountry. I've seen go bags with all sorts of things. Note that this also includes, to my mind, your EDC or everyday carry. This is the stuff you grab before walking out of the house every day. For most people, that's wallets, phone, and keys. Mine also includes pepper spray on my keychain, a 5-inch Spyderco knife, often used for box cutting, sunglasses. What you choose to carry and what you choose to add to your bug-out bag, pack, setup is entirely up to you. It varies wildly because it depends on where you intend to go and why you're leaving your house in the first place. It makes it simpler for me to make a checklist for the following. Destination. Water. Food. Clothing. Blankets. Self-defense. Tools. Medical. Hygiene. Communications. Documents and records. Valuables. Can you make a pace plan that covers everything above? What other things would make your list? Family keepsakes? Your Magic the Gathering collection? For me, this is easy. When I was eight, my mother lost a custody battle and kidnapped my brother and I. We lived under assumed names for a year, always moving from school to school. All my possessions fit in a go bag. We traveled light. Readiness drills. Once you've figured out what you think can be stored in your vehicle, and where you're going to go, and what's important to pack, you're only halfway done. Use it or lose it. If you don't practice a skill, then it will gradually erode. I used to be an amazing programmer. I made big bucks. Today, I would inch through any project fumbling and rusty, until I rediscovered flow. I'm new to firearms, as we'll talk about in the next chapter, but every veteran marksman I know tells me to drill. Muscle memory is key. Conduct a readiness drill. It doesn't have to involve your family, unless you think they'll be into it and not think you're crazy, but you need to know what needs to be done. Pack everything. Load the car up. See how long it takes. How could you make it faster? That could matter, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe you're happy with your setup. Awesome. Now you know. Camping makes a great excuse. You'll hear this theme repeated often, and for good reason. Camping is a way that preppers can LARP, live-action role-play, an SHTF scenario. Packing for camping is basically throwing a bunch of go-bags in a vehicle and bugging out to a pre-selected destination. While there, especially if you hike through the backcountry, you learn to filter your own water. You learn the value of literally every object you carry, because weight matters when you're hiking many miles a day. Perhaps the most important lesson is that while you can easily find clean water in many wilderness areas, food is a lot harder for those of us with no hunting or fishing experience. When you're hiking, you only have the food you bring with you. When we hiked the John Muir Trail, we had to carry seven days of supplies with one resupply point for the second half of the trail. I never saw that second half, because the Sierras were on fire. The wall of smoke drove us out, and we had to be evacuated. Thankfully, my mother-in-law was monitoring our satellite phone and arranged to pick us up. Because we had everything we needed with us, we were able to hike to an alternate evac point and get rescued. I'll never again look at life the same way. Water, food, air conditioning. 
toilets. It's all a luxury, not the norm. And it could all vanish in a heartbeat. If it did, if the fires are coming for your house, what will you do? If you're a camper, then at least one part of the problem is already solved. Chris's shopping list. Spyderco knife. Sunglasses. Exercise number six. Prepare a go bag or load your vehicle with gear, whichever is more appropriate. Make sure to keep anything you load out of sight or you're inviting theft. Bonus. Go camping. Run a readiness drill. Pack your vehicle and head out to a fictional bug out location. Note that your family doesn't need to know it's anything other than camping unless they are also seeking to be prepared. Chapter 7 Defense I grew up broke in El Cajon, near San Diego, in the late 70s and early 1980s. No internet, no cell phones, no DVDs or even VCRs. We left the house after breakfast and were expected to be home when the streetlights came on. My father and brother regularly kicked my scrawny ass, not uncommon in the early 1980s. Back then it wasn't abuse, it was discipline. I'm not condoning it, but there were upsides. It's hard to fear something that has occurred regularly to you. It's easy to fear something bad that you've never experienced. I got into fist fights regularly, and by the time I hit high school, I was hitting back, no matter how big the other kid was. I never became some MMA fighter, but I could take a punch and throw one if I had to. I won as many fights as I lost. You know what it taught me? I don't like being punched. I don't like punching people. But weakness invites attack. In middle school, from age 11 to 13, bullies picked on me because I was the quiet nerd sitting in the corner, reading Dungeons and Dragons source books, or whatever fantasy novel I could get my hands on. I was oblivious to my surroundings, and they took full advantage. Until I learned awareness. Once I knew what to look for to check my surroundings and to avoid dangerous situations, life began to improve. As I grew up, some people called this street smarts. They're valuable, but if I ever found myself in a real life and death situation, then I was toast, and I knew it. There are predators and prey, and I was prey, until I took charge of my own training. Starting Strength when I say training, I don't mean martial arts or the Vulcan nerve pinch. I started with simple free weights. I used a program called Starting Strength, and over the course of about six months, I went from a doughy weakling to a wall of muscle. I was 34 years old, 11 years ago. I remember it vividly. I can still see the first gym in my mind's eye. And the second. I began lifting weights and loved it. I loved the way it made me feel. I loved the way it made others assess me differently. People took me more seriously. I still remember a coworker I had a crush on telling me that I looked really good. It did wonders for my confidence. And all this muscle also meant I was no longer the most likely target of a mugger. I was no longer prey. Lifting for strength is amazing for your self-confidence. I don't care what gender you are. I don't care how old you are. It has a huge list of positives if done correctly and habitually. There are no downsides I can think of, except for the time and expense involved. Boxing and Martial Arts All of my friends who served in the military tell me that a hand-to-hand -hand fight is the very last thing you want to be involved in. No matter how good you are, no matter how fast you are, if you take a hit, you could go down with permanent damage. You could fracture your skull on pavement. However, Knowing how to dodge a punch and throw one yourself can make the difference in a dangerous situation. About two years after I started working out, I took some simple boxing classes, enough that I understood ducking and weaving, and all six punches. I'm not a great boxer, but man, I love slamming the bag. Fast forward three more years, I'd taken my first engineering job in the big scary city, San Francisco. Every morning I worked out at the 24-hour fitness in Larkspur then rode the ferry into work. I loved taking a boat to work. One day I needed to deposit my check manually for some reason and found myself walking down Market Street. For those who don't know, this is the artery of San Francisco's financial district, 
and I'd always assumed it was a decent area. Oh, how little I knew. It was fine for a few blocks, and then quickly deteriorated into a dangerous slum, one no sane tourist would be caught in. I continued anyway, as it was just a few more blocks to my credit union, but the amount of garbage and the smell of urine increased dramatically. There were no more North Face jackets. We weren't in that part of town anymore. My danger sense went on full alert. I already keep my phone in my pocket when walking in the city, and this made me glad I did. I could see people sizing up the few tourists stupid enough to have wandered off the beaten path into their hunting grounds. And then it happened. A guy loomed from an alley to block my path with a little pocket knife. He barked at me that I needed to give him my wallet. What I did next wasn't smart. It wasn't something I'd recommend. But after four decades of taking other people's shit, of being stepped on and pushed aside, and yes, mugged, I wasn't taking it anymore. Come and take it, I told him, and slid into a boxing stance. I plucked my knife from my belt and found that it was larger than his. He was taller, but if he worked out, it was nowhere near as much as I did. I'd become a power lifter. I might not look like much, but I was confident I could break this guy in half. And he sensed that confidence. So he waved at me and said, Man, you're not worth it. You're right, I affirmed, meeting his stare. I'm not. He retreated, and I got to keep my wallet, paycheck, and phone. It happened because I'd trained for six years at that point, in strength, boxing, and general awareness. In confidence. Always be aware of your surroundings, and if possible, find a style of self-defense that works for you. Since that day, I carry pepper spray on my keychain. It won't stop an attacker but it will make their life suck for about 20 or 30 seconds. You do not want my undivided attention for 20 seconds when I can hit you, and you can't fight back. If you're smaller or conflict-averse, then 20 seconds is one heck of a head start. Firearms If you live in a state that allows you to carry a concealed firearm, then guns really are the great equalizer. Many of my female friends carry one, though their families would probably be shocked to realize it. They keep it secret, but stay prepared. Not long ago, I saw a video of a woman being accosted. A car stops on a deserted street, and a man leaps out, with the obvious intent of sexually assaulting her. She tried backing away, but when he came at her, she whipped out a pistol and shot him twice. He bled out. She got away. Because I'm a larger guy, I worry less about direct confrontation and believe carrying a gun would create as many problems as it solved, so I have no interest in my concealed carry permit. I have a child at home. I don't want firearms that he can harm himself with, no matter how many security precautions I have in place. I can't risk a pistol. But I also know how fast a situation can go south, and how quickly people will turn on each other when there are no immediate consequences from a perceived authority like the government. So I picked up a shotgun. A Mossberg 590 tactical as a matter of fact. With a fancy flashlight along the barrel. Big, heavy, hard to chamber around without upper body strength. I made this choice deliberately. I made it after a great deal of research and after consulting with my wife. Our son is two as of this writing. My shotgun is stored in a safe with a second lock around the chamber. The ammo is stored in a hidden safe elsewhere in the house. Even if he found the gun and the ammo, he can't fire it. And he can't point it at himself until he is the size of an adult. That was important to me. Other people, especially people with no children, find that a pistol is a better option. If you believe a firearm is a prudent prep, then it's important to find one that works for you. My buddy Trevor took me shooting back in 2014, then on a pig hunt the following year. I'd never been hunting and never fired a gun. By the end of that trip, I'd fired several rifles, several pistols, and a pair of shotguns. Pistols require precision, incredible aim, the same proved true of the rifles, like the 308. I like the training to be effective with either, because they require hundreds of hours, if not more, to master. Trevor is a marksman with all his weapons, because he has devoted that time. Ah, but a shotgun is a different animal entirely. 
Growing up, I played a ton of first-person shooter video games. Imagine my surprise when I find out a shotgun works like it did on the screen. We went skeet shooting, and I tagged 19 clay targets in a row. It was easy. Leading the target came naturally. I loved it. Current events concerned me enough that I felt obtaining a firearm was prudent. Every week I see more crime, and I vividly remember the rampant inflation from my childhood. It's just starting again, and it will not be over quickly. Desperate people do desperate things. I need to be ready for my son. It's unlikely a shotgun will help me do that, but if I need it, I want to own it. But as I told my wife, it's much more likely that she'll laugh at me when we're 90 and say, wasn't that stupid gun you never needed a huge waste of money? Yep, I'll laugh, knowing that it was some of the cheapest therapy I ever bought. My first trip to the range was terrifying. It had been years since I'd touched a gun. Lots of years. And then only in the presence of a marksman who could show me how not to kill myself. I felt weird, but no one gave me strange looks. They all seemed to think I belonged there. I put up a target, put on my eyewear and ear protection, and chambered my first round, and then promptly ejected it onto the pavement. I didn't understand that when you yank the lever toward you, that's ejecting the old cartridge, and that if you want to fire, you have to push it away from you to chamber a round. I felt like an idiot, but no one noticed, and I figured it out quickly. Now I go to the range every two weeks and run 20 to 30 rounds through my Mossberg. I carefully drill the same way every time. Snap to shoulder, sight at target, safety off, squeeze trigger, rack new round. Over and over and over until it becomes muscle memory. Will I ever need to use the shotgun? Probably not. My wife is usually right, and probably will be about this too. But I trust my instincts. If crime comes to our area, and home invasions become a thing, I'm now confident that I can protect my family. That's important to me. Owning a firearm gives me peace of mind. I'm not afraid of guns anymore. It's the people threatening my family or my community who should be afraid. The Gray Man Philosophy The very first time I found the Prepper subreddit, the top thread was about being a gray man. The name intrigued me because I recognized it from my favorite series of books, The Wheel of Time. In that series, the Shadow sends assassins to kill our heroes. These assassins are called Gray Men. The mortal eye slides off them. You don't notice them in crowds. They are invisible even while in plain sight. The Purple community advises you to be a Gray Man. Fade into your background. Don't advertise your preps. Don't draw attention. It's good advice, even if I don't personally follow it most of the time. I share so that others can learn and contribute to their communities. At a certain point, I believe we all have a responsibility to give back, but I also recognize that it places me at risk. If your risk tolerance is low, then be a gray man. Tell no one of your preps, and never show anything to suggest you are worth attention. Chris's Shopping List Mossberg 590 Pepper Spray Exercise number seven. Choose a method of defending yourself. Boxing, MMA, a self-defense course, pepper spray, cardio so you can run away. Invest in that area and drill it until it becomes habit. Bonus. Apply a pace plan to your self-defense. What are the most common situations you might find yourself in physical danger? How can you de-escalate or escape the situation? If you can't, what do you do?